Maybe one day you looked up in the sky and asked yourself, why are these planes following each other and how do they know it's the correct path to follow? Well, to answer these questions, we first need to look at the premise of aviation a century ago and understand how it slowly evolved to its current state. Back in the days, aviators would follow landmarks like rivers, railway, roads, or any other highly visible thing from the sky, like towers, antennas, lake, etc. It's very reliable because the lake that was here yesterday will still be here tomorrow. But there is a downside of it. It's called Mother Nature. Tower, tower, help me, I can't see anything. I am lost. Why do you ask for a tower, idiot? We are in 1909. These doesn't exist yet. Another technique used by our fellow aviators was dead reconning, where they would follow a heading for XX amount of time to go to their destination. For example, if you take off from Detroit and follow a east heading for XX hours, you would arrive at Boston. But if Mother Nature decides to trick you again with a strong wind coming from the north, you might end up in New York. Oh, look how fast they developed Boston. This is amazing. They even put a statue in the water. James, I know five dumb guys in this planet, and you are four of them. As these visual techniques were too much dependent of the weather, engineers and armies invented the first nave aids in the 1930s called Non-Directional Beacon, or NDB. Later in the 1950s came the VHF Omnidirectional Range, or VOR, these beacons would allow pilots to navigate reliably and independently of the weather conditions. It was a huge step up for aviation and greatly helped developing commercial operations during the 60s and 70s. So you might think problem solved. If pilots can fly thanks to these beacons, we just have to put beacons everywhere on planet Earth so airplanes can navigate easily. Well, you would be right, except for a little thing, money. Navigation beacons are material products, which means they cost something to build and also have some maintenance costs that your taxpayer money take care of. It also brings another problem. How do you fly overseas? Should we create artificial island just to build a VOR on it? That doesn't make sense. So engineers came back to the design table and had to find a way to create navigation aids without having to build or maintain anything. Ultimately, they found something and how boy it was revolutionary for aviation. The concept is simple. If you know precisely the position of an object, then you can calculate all of its movement thanks to accelerometers and gyroscopes. That way you can predict future position of that object only based on the reference point. In other words, it's the GPS before GPS was invented and allow any plane to know its position without relying on any satellite or external communication device. This principle is called inertial navigation and is the current way planes know where they are. Nevertheless, inertial navigation systems have a drawback. They tend to drift. That drift creates a position error that would increase with distance, mainly due to accelerometers and gyroscope imprecision. Modern inertial navigation systems are becoming more and more precise. For a Paris to New York flight, the drift between calculated position and actual position is less than a nautical mile, which is extremely accurate for a seven-hour flight. Latest technology added en route GPS recalibration to minimize the drift of inertial navigation. But why is it game-changer? Well, as planes know exactly their position, aviation organizations and authorities can create as many waypoints they want, because waypoints are now non-material things. It doesn't need to be build or maintain. Just give it a name and a position, and you are done. The sky above you is full of immaterial waypoints that planes cross every day. Free website like skyvector.com are great to see them. Tell me which waypoint is above your area in the comments section. I am curious about it. So this is where we are about modern navigation. Planes will follow a sequence of waypoints until they reach their destination. You might have noticed some waypoints are rounds and some other looks like a compass. A round shapes is a waypoint. Compass is a VOR. Of course, during your flight, you don't need to switch between inertial navigation and VOR navigation. In that case, the VOR just act like a waypoint, and their name is always three letters in your flight plan. You might also have noticed there are some lines joining waypoints together. They are called airways, and they aim to regroup a sequence of waypoint to create a highway in the sky. For example, you could say at waypoint Cephi, 
you want to join the airway Q862 and follow this route until Yega. Then from Yega, you would like to follow airway Q963 until exiting at Lira to continue to your destination airport. The major advantage of airway is similar to you on a road trip. You would prefer enter the highway and exit at your destination instead of going through each small towns or villages all along the way. As a result, they greatly reduce the number of waypoints you have to enter during your pre-flight briefing. For example here, from Halifax I will join Airway Q29 with an exit at the Jamestown VOR, and all waypoints along the route has been added automatically to my flight plan. The other advantage of Airway is that they improve traffic flow, as all airplane coming from a location to another will follow the same route. It will let enough time for the controller to space these aircraft in a secure way, instead of letting them coming at the same time on the airport, increasing traffic congestion. Now that you know everything about en route waypoints and airways, let's get back to our flight plan defined in the previous video. The beginning and end of the route often comes with departure and arrival. We can identify them easily thanks to the digit at the end. We will skip them for now and dedicate this knowledge for the next video. The route starts with ditch, one of the exit points of Philadelphia. After ditch, we see numbers meaning we are about to enter an airway. In that case, the airway is Q437, and the next waypoint is our exit waypoint, named HANA. At HANA, we will take airway Q450, and it's planned to exit this airway at the Kennedy VOR. The Kennedy VOR is the beginning of our arrival, which we will see later. And that's it for basic knowledge about modern en route navigation. I hope you are now a pro with Simbrief Flight Plan and gain a little bit of knowledge about how plane navigation evolved over time. Next videos will be on SIDs and STARS, then we will finish with how to perform an ILS approach. Thanks for watching, feel free to like and subscribe for more content.